Chapter 6 I learned many things that day, and one of them was that absolute fear does unexpected things to you. It gives you a massive surge of energy. It slows time down, so that's all you can think about. It stops you feeling pain. I must have bashed myself on something as I raced towards my brother, but I didn't even notice it until later when I found a big bruise turning dark blue on my arm. Before I'd reached Musa, the troops had opened fire again. The demonstrators were scattering, running down side streets or trying to force a passage back through the hundreds of others coming on behind them. The soldiers were rushing after them, hitting out with batons, kicking those who had fallen on the ground, rounding up any that they'd managed to catch and dragging them back to the trucks. My eyes were darting up and down the street. There was no chance that Musa could outrun the soldiers. We would have to find a hiding place. I saw it just in time, a narrow passageway between two shops, half hidden by a big garbage bin. Musa hadn't noticed me, although I was practically shouting in his ear. He was steadily filming the mayhem all around. Stop it, you fool, I yelled and snatched the phone out of his hands. He turned on me furiously. Give it back, how dare you? I pushed him into the passageway. It was dark and littered with rubbish. My mind was racing. If Musa was caught with the phone on him, arrest and torture would be the least he could expect. Then I saw above my head a small window covered with a grill. It wasn't the perfect hiding place, but it was better than nothing. I jumped up and stood the phone on the sill. Give it back. Give it to me, screamed Musa. Are you crazy? It's your death sentence if they find it. He's a quick thinking, Musa. He frowned at me, then nodded reluctantly. Get it down and switch it off. Someone will find it if it rings. Then hide it up there again. We'll come back for it tomorrow. Make sure you remember where the place is. I'm not taking orders from you. I snapped back at him. For Allah's sake, Omar, just do it. I hated the idea of touching the phone again, but I knew he was right. If it was found, they'd be bound to find out who owned it, and the link would be made back to Musa. I grabbed a broken chair, balanced on it, and managed to fish the thing off the sill. Give it here, said Musa. He switched it off, and I got it back into its hiding place. I was only just in time. A soldier appeared at the end of the passageway, standing in sinister silhouette against the bright sunlight beyond. His head looked huge and threatening in its metal helmet. He started down towards us, stumbling on the rubbish. Musa collapsed against me, drooping his head onto my shoulder. He gave me a sharp nudge and I understood what he wanted me to do. Thank God you're here, brother, I whimpered to the soldier. We were so frightened, having those crazy people gone. Had they gone? Yeah, growled the soldier. Crazies like you. You were with them. You're under arrest. Musa started making babbling noises and let dribble come out of his mouth. We didn't know what was happening, I said. We're from Bosra. We're visiting our auntie. The soldier was looking with disgust at the jewel tricking onto Musa's shirt. It's my brother, I said. I'm supposed to be looking after him. He's a cripple, soft in the head. The soldier leaned down and peered closely at Musa. Then he shot out his fist. It stopped a centimetre before it hit Musa's nose. Musa automatically ducked to avoid it and lost his balance. His arms flailed wildly and he made a mewing noise. In spite of the awful danger we were in, I had to suppress a grin of admiration. There was contempt rather than suspicion in the soldier's eyes now. Damn loony, he said. Should have been strangled at birth. Get him out of here. He watched us, eyes narrowed as we stumbled out the passageway into the daylight. Musa kept up the pretense, hanging on to me as if he could hardly walk and flailing his arms around until we were well away from the soldier. Don't stop, I hissed at him. There are more soldiers over there. Wait till we're well away, okay? It wasn't until we were a few streets away that we dared walk normally. It was much quieter here, although we could still hear the sounds of fighting from the direction of the main road. Shouts, screams and the rumble of military engines. Soft in the head, am I? Musa croaked at me. I'll make you pay for that, little brother. I grinned at him. No, you won't. I've just saved your wobbly backside. Or have you forgotten already? We began as fast as Musa could walk, but he suddenly stopped and said, But where are we? I think that's the corner of Auntie Madge's road, I said, pointing. I recognise the blue sign. Let's go and wait at her place till all this is over. Musa hesitated. I'm letting Basem down. I ought to be with the others. I can't just... He was interrupted by the crack of several shots and more shouts that sounded closer than ever before. I grabbed his arm. Quick, I think they're coming this way. He didn't go on arguing. Thank goodness. When we reached a corner of the street, I grunted with relief. I've been right. Uncle Faisal and Auntie Madge's flat was only a few metres away. The dark entrance to the building, which had seemed almost sinister on our previous visit, looked positively welcoming now. 
we dived into its shelter just as the first demonstrators erupted into the far end of the street. They were running fast towards us, and behind them came the ominous roar of an army lorry. It was so dark in the building entrance that at first I didn't see the two figures huddled on the bottom step of the street, as it was there that I could see the steep, narrow stairway. Then I heard an excited, high-pitched voice shout, Moosey! Omi! And a pair of small arms wrapped themselves around my legs. Nadia! I picked her up. What are you doing out here? Go back upstairs. Go and find Auntie Madger. The dark shape of the city on the stairs stood up, and I saw that it was Granny. Granny, what's happened? Go back in, it's not safe out here. Granny came towards us, out of the shadows, and I saw her face. It's pale oval framed by her close-fitting black abaya. Her eyes were sparking with anger. We can't go in. They've all gone out. She knew I was coming. Madger did. I left a message with Faisal. He took them away deliberately. My Madger would never do this to me. We've been sitting here for hours waiting for them. I didn't want to go home. Your mother, she sagged, suddenly looking lost and helpless. Her lips were trembling. I actually felt sorry for her. Nadia began bouncing in my arms. Tickle me on me, tickle, Nadia. Not now, Habiti. Keep still. I was desperately trying to think. Moose was looking out into the street. Boys were running past us now. Suddenly, Moose shouted, Latif, over here! I saw one of the runners swerve sideways, look over his shoulder and dart across to Musa. You can't stay here, he panted. They're doing house-to-house searches, arresting any man or boy not in their own home. This is my aunt's place, said Musa, speaking as slowly and clearly as he could. She's not here. We can't get in. Look, there's my granny and my little sister. We've got to get them home. Latif hesitated. I peered round him and looked down the road. I could see the army lorry now, but it had actually stopped moving. The soldiers were still some way away. Granny tugged at my arm. What's going on? I heard shooting. Who's this boy? What's Musa saying? I resisted the urge to shake her off. Musa's trying to get us home, Granny. It's been a lot of trouble downtown. Her face took on its usual sneer. Musa, what can he do? He's worse than useless. I ignored her. I was trying to hear what Latif was saying. I heard Musa give him the name of our street and saw Latif pull a long face. Then another boy running past saw him and dashed over. It was Basem. Musa, he said excitedly. Did you get food? I think so, Musa nodded. I planted the phone. It's safe for now. We'll pick it up tomorrow. Well, where is it? Musa grinned. Best you don't know. I stepped up to join them, with Nadia in my arms and Granny clinging to my sleeve. Basem's eyes widened. What are they doing here? Got stranded, I said. We've got to get them home. They live over beyond the fire station, said the thief. Basem shook his head. No chance of getting over there till all this is over. Not by the streets. There is a way, said Latif. Best for us too, Basem. We go behind the pharmacy, round the back of the garage, through the building site, and over a few backyards. There are some walls to jump, but we'll stay off the streets. Basem's eyes narrowed as he followed the route in his mind. Good. We'll do it. He nodded towards Granny. She can manage. Do you think? I don't know how we'll get her over the walls. Granny caught his words. Get me over the walls? Now look over here, you young man. An explosion at the far end of the street made us all start. Granny gave a little scream. Is that shooting? We'll all be killed. Blooms of white smoke were slowly coiling along the street towards us. Tear gas, said Basem. We've got to get out of here. Now. I won't. I can't, began Granny. I was losing patience. Granny, do you want to choke to death? Do you want to be shot? I shouted at her. Just do what Basem and Latif say. They'll get us home. Here, give me the baby, said Latif, holding his arms out to Nadia. Look after the old lady, Omar. Let's go. Basem was looking out of the entrance. He waved to us to follow him. Come on, now. We were on the pavement for no more than a few seconds before Latif and Basem plunged into a narrow alleyway that ran along the side the pharmacy beneath Auntie Madra's building. The sight of soldiers armed with guns coming up the street had made Granny momentarily freeze with shock. But then she caught a whiff of tear gas. She put the end of her abaya up to her face and with her other hand, she gripped my arm so fiercely that it felt like a claw. I think I would almost have enjoyed that mad scramble over walls, down dark alleyways and through deserted buildings if it hadn't been for Moosa and Granny. I was scared that Moosa would hold us up and afraid that Granny would fall or scream and draw attention to us. Every wall and heap of rubble was a challenge for both of them. I must admit though, my respect for Granny shot up that day. She followed Latif and Basem without a word, even when we had to lift her up and hand her over walls like a bonny parcel. She did nothing more than grunt. On her feet again, 
she just dusted herself down and dusted down her long black abeya scuttled after the boys like a busy black beetle. Musa managed somehow. I didn't see why I should help him. He'd got me into this after all. It was nearly half an hour before we got near home. The streets in our part of town were quiet and empty. We know where we are now, Musa panted as the fire station came into view. Thanks, guys. You really saved us. We were in trouble back there. Worked out well for us, too, said Bassem. They'd have caught us if we'd gone on running. Latif tried to set Nadia down. She'd clung on to him silently all the way, her arms wrapped closely around his neck, her eyes wide with fright, and now she seemed reluctant to be prized away from him. Ma's waiting for you. We're nearly home, I coaxed her. Ma, Ma, she burst into wails. Bassem pulled Musa, Musa aside. When will you pick it up? He asked him. As soon as it's quiet. I need someone to help me, though. I said Ahmed round. Don't bother, I cut him. I'll go. Musa shook his head. Not you, Omar. Too dangerous. His superior tone annoyed me. I said I'll go. Granny holding the wailing Nadia by the hand was already crossing the road and heading fast towards the entrance to our building. I hurried after her. She turned a stern face towards me. Who are those two boys and what's Musa got to do with them? He's their classmate. They're from school. Musa's friends. Friends? Already? He's only been at the school a few weeks. They're using him. They can see that he's simple. They've taken him in. I felt my temperature rise. There's nothing simple about Musa. I was speaking too angrily and forced myself to drop my voice. Musa's really clever, Granny. Musa's cleverer than, than me. Or am I? He doesn't look it. He's got the face of an imbecile. I heard a shout overhead and headed. Appeared suddenly through the thick dust of greenery on our balcony. A man had seen us coming. You boys are up to something, Granny said. You can't pull the wall over my eyes. I'm not up to anything, I said with a shudder. I just want to get home. You can't have been out there in the middle of all that without a reason, she said. Ma sent us out to fetch Nadia, I told her angrily. We ran into the march without realising. We were inside the building by now and starting up the stairs. Musa was close behind. Granny turned and gave him a sharp look. What did that boy Bassem mean when he said, did you get it? Musa smiled at her, innocently. You really don't want to know, Granny. She frowned at him. I can't understand a word that boy says, she mutters. There was no time for more. First Amman, then Ma, came clattering down the stairs to meet us with cries of relief and questions. <laughs>